Oh, perfect. So welcome to everyone. Really welcome because we are here uh, seated in our coach and introducing our Linea Pele first edition of OM edition of Now and Together. And it's really interesting because we are talking to our community right now. And this first uh, edition, the first week, it's uh, sharing with our international and national social community our thoughts, uh, some spicy tips that come up in our minds. And uh, let me just tell you that the first very strong message that we want to underline today, which is our mantra, is let inspire you. So what's going on? So in this case, uh, I'm, I just really want to uh, share inspiration, those insights. Uh, we are a community and we internally, we talking together in this kind of days, uh, after or during the coronavirus, we have so many different things that come up and can also disrupt uh, the situation. So maybe some of you ask, oh, who are you? So let me introduce me because I'm Marietta Pellizzari. I'm Alina Pelle Fashion Advisor. But now uh, in real time, I'm telling you that I'm a, a global virtual traveler yeah, this is what I'm doing right now. And today I'm not alone because you, of course, you are with us. And I can see, oh wow, I can also see that there are like almost 200 people connected right now. Wow, that's great. But today we are traveling in California. So that's good. So let me introduce you our today guest. And today, Emily Samora, she's directly in real time from LA, uh, Industrial Design Studio. So good morning, Emily. So how is the weather? How is in LA today? You know what, Orieta, it is, it is quite early on my standards this morning. It is, <laughs> but we <laughs> finally have good weather. Um, so it's great. Wow, good, cool. So, and now let's jump into our other today's speaker, Sharon, Sharon Roth, our fashion disruptor buyer. So where are you today? In California, somewhere Seattle. else? Seattle. Seattle, Washington. Wow, that's great. So I'm just dreaming to be there. So uh, should we start to our live conversation to share with our community? what we think about, because you need to know community that of course we was already 20 minutes that we were chatting, sharing topics. In the meantime, we, we, we have having our breakfast and for me, my afternoon tea, but let's go. First disrupted topic, buy less, buy better. So seems that some rumors are talking about this kind of things for B2C or B2B. So what do you think? Oh, Sharon, do you have any uh, opinion? Yeah, Which is so your, your opinion? When I brought that topic up with you the other day, I, what I mean is like what Italy's, Italy's is known for beautiful quality and known for its small batch and beautiful it's it's about it's not it's like I it's not about mass production. It's about quality and uh, it's about um, I wanted my disrupting way is to stop the madness of making all this um, non quality kind of plastic looking leather bags and 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 things in in the leather sector and really going back to the roots of beauty. What is real leather? What is handwork? What is what is what reminded me of Italy before, before what it's come to at this time. Yeah, so, and in buy, buy better? Yeah, buy better, buy more quality and to educate the consumer and to educate uh, the end consumer and to educate the buyer so that they understand what is 
something, why, why is it beautiful? It, it, it's going back to the roots, going back to the carriage trade, going back to um, just smaller batches, more valuable. Like, like even why do you need one bag for every 10, every, every day, to a new bag? Why not one gorgeous bag that is beautiful that every time you look at it, it reminds you of how it was made or but to get back the the idea to the consumer how it was made who made it you know the family that was together that made the bag or why did it come about you know that's that's kind of what when i was talking to you what i was meaning and then return, return to the appreciation of quality and why why and how what made the bag for example why did the leather why did you choose that leather for that bag et cetera, et cetera. And what about Emily's uh, regarding industrial design? Try to explain a little bit what, what you what you do in a, a industrial design, transportation design. What does this mean? Okay. So my background is in automotive design. I've designed interiors and exteriors of automotive vehicles. Um, I'm, my background is also in product design. I was working again automotive at Ford. Then I went to Nike and then we've started our own consultancy. So at this consultancy, we focus on two things, performance and innovation. So brands come to us to help restructure their brand from a design side for a design strategy. Um, and then we also do the actual industrial design for footwear, apparel, bags. Uh, we work on projects that are super various from automotive all the way down to, you know, just footwear projects. So we're kind of, we call ourselves Ernst everything because we do a bit of everything. Um, so my, my point of view, and so this is something that we were talking about with Sharon earlier, is that I try to set up companies so that they can be proactive to think about things and to give them the time to do this. And I think that's very important because without planning an organization, there's such a rush that things get to be almost jumbled up. It becomes too much. So buy less, buy better also feeds into that idea. With um, buy less and buy better, I think it's super important that people understand the value of things and to get better quality. Mm -hmm. uh, something Sharon was talking about earlier that I really liked is that she said she wants people to fall in love with Italy again. But I think you know, on a global scale, people really need to understand the importance of quality over quantity. And I think that's, again, echoing what Sharon was saying is quality over quantity is so important that we need to restructure from a very ethical standpoint how to do these things. And I think right now is such a key and prime time to do these things. And like you were talking about greenwashing just a minute ago before we, we were on, sustainability is loving your gorgeous quality made product and not buying 25 bags you buy one and you love it and it's gorgeous and every time you use that zipper it really works it doesn't fall apart and as it gets older and aged it's more beautiful leather gets more beautiful with age a scratch is a good thing it reminds you of a time it doesn't have to be oh my god it's ruined i need something else you know it's about cherishing and loving your item that you know even a shoe you know it could be anything just that it's Yes, but quality. some people are just worrying like another part of the topic because, you know, imagine a need, an ideal scenario where uh, so we are buying less, consume less. So our production is impacted according to consumption changes. So we like to, to think about uh, reshoring or authentic made in Italy. We already talked about authentic made in Italy, but even regional made, which is a kind of new uh, patriotic, uh, um, new nationalist uh, way to say this is made. It's made in Italy, it's made in US, it's made in Japan, it's made in, in a, some specific localized. That's, yeah, that's exactly though what what Italy is known for leather so like you're saying every but everybody would make it in their own area and it would be smaller batches and like you were saying production you don't need to gear up if it's if it's you 
you can gear up to, to a medium size. It doesn't have to be mass in selling to the junk stores. It's, it's, it's like what I was saying earlier, farm to table. It's like, what is a gorgeous less? I, there was only 150 of these made. So I'm gonna spend a little more on this better item rather than buying 25 items at 20 euro. Because it, it, it's more beautiful. It's, it's worth kind of, it's the same thing. You don't need to gear up such huge production but what how do you how do you think in this way emily because we were talking about reshoring and actually was your first point that you were talking even just uh, one month ago before that us had this kind of uh, struggling moment so are you dealing right now with your international client or Yes, for our larger international clients, we're just really trying to figure out how to restructure the process of everything. Um, again, because organization is key. But as far as reshoring is concerned, I feel it, it is really important to, to make things within the country um, and to support that community. Uh, but it has its limitations as well. So a lot of the brands we work with also want to do reshoring. Sure. And we have been looking into, you know, with our U.S. brands, where can things be made in the U.S. versus, you know, if the main consumer base is in a certain continent, we need to move that production there so that this, the process becomes a lot smoother. And then within that is sustainability as well. Yeah, but do you see, maybe you see that this authenticity can help the production to find another way to reestablish uh, the way they, they were working or will take longer time? Because of course, it's not so easy, it's not so fast to change this kind of structure, I think, even in a design way. Yeah, it's very tough. Um, and it's tough because of competencies and capabilities that countries have currently. Um, for example, it's very difficult to move out of China because of a pricing, but also the technical capabilities that they have as far as performance and technical finishings is superb. Whereas when you come to America, it's a lot fewer of options. The pricing is higher, but that's something that these brands need to really consider as far as what's going to be best. And I think that's going to be something that I'm hoping that most brands are reconsidering right now is how can we organize things to be the best in terms of sustainability and efficiency. I like designing what I've always, Jarbo, I've always made things in our business where the raw materials came from. That's always been how I was. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, what I always do when I first talk to a new factory is I go, what is your specialty? What is it that you know how to do best? What is it that I can have you make that I'm not asking you to go make, don't make this that I want to, that I've made over here and you have to retool. What is it that's in your sweet spot? And then we go and do with them what they feel comfortable in. But it's the same thing that we're talking about. To me, I see the, the, the birth of new businesses that can start slow, that want slow, that want beauty, that want quality. And some of these big behemoth businesses might have a harder time. And it might, if this yes. comes like, like I was saying, farm to table, if, if there comes from this younger generation that they really want real sustainability, real beautiful quality, real goods, I think the change could happen and you, we might see more like little, like after the volcano, you see the little green spurts of new grass growing that could be new businesses. It's kind of what you're saying, taking the time now with this coronavirus and everybody's kind of rethinking. So the big companies, maybe they don't need as much or maybe like you said, the treadmill can slow down and then there could be new birth for these little guys. Mm -hmm. And then the little guys go work with, through with the big guys, like how they would buy them or I don't know. It's just, maybe it doesn't need to be all big guys too. We need some interest. So yeah. new may, I, may I ask you just here in real time, can I, can I read some, uh, some questions? Because I, I'm just reading. Uh, you, you, can, you can as well. But I think there is one very interesting question for one of the, participant they want to just to say that buying less but better can make me uh, make disappear 
hearing the middle, uh, the middle section. So this means that maybe uh, we need to change more. We need to have more differencing differences between like personalization, which is on the top, and the mass product. So what, what do you think about this? Which can be the reaction in this kind of way? So middle uh, section is completely disappearing, maybe, or not. Well, be dead. You know, it used to be in the olden days that someone saved up for like a long time and then they'd go out and buy themselves a beautiful bag, you know? And, or, or like a beautiful a pair of shoes, you know, maybe, it, it, Things have gotten so easy just to get this, get a new iPhone, get a new pair of tennis shoes, get a new this. Maybe things become more special and more, you, you save up a little and then you do spend a little more rather than getting the shoe for $79.99. You go and spend $200 or $250 for your special shoe that you're developing that's going to take more time. And that it, it's it maybe things become more, because junk and landfill, it's, it's all part of the whole, these younger generation care to buy less. You know, it, it's, it's like even my son, he's so proud. He goes to the Goodwill and he buys his clothes and how little he paid and how he, he's not buying anything new to pollute the world. They really care. So it's not the middle section could, in fact, just buy less, buy better quality, save and care and know that that's more sustainable than junk, than um, filling our landfill, et cetera, et cetera. I'm really and high, maybe the high, high. Yeah, more money, yeah. but more, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So with me, I think that middle section actually does have a really strong hold. Um, we have some brands that are going from middle, pushing to be a little bit more premium, which I think is a great space to be, but you really, I feel the brands really need to differentiate themselves with some advancement, whether it is some story and some idea about innovation or sustainability, it needs to have substance to it. And I think that's what's super important. Um, to me, my thought is let's let the big companies work the, the, the low tier channels, the bottom. So we have price points, low tier, mass volume, because the big companies, they won't stop, right? So it's up to the mid and the top tier brands to actually push initiative and to to make right decisions and choices. And I think that's going to be super key, not only to grow your brand, but to have an opinion for your brand as well. And a voice for your brand, I think is, is really key. And for, you know, as Sharon was saying, for the current consumers or the younger consumers now, having a purpose, having a voice, that's all really important. It is. For a young consumer into buying into a brand because buying into a brand is more about buying into pretty much an ethos and a lifestyle right now. So being very clear on what your brand message is and what your brand strategy is and, and telling that story to your consumers, that's super key. But you can't tell fake stories, right? There's- it, the Authenticity, you, yeah. You can't do greenwashing these days. It has to be really honest and real. And, and it's, again, you know, I, I hate to kill creativity by saying it's all about strategy, but that's that's kind of you you need to build from a great strategy in order to achieve where you need to go mm -hmm. yeah i think it's you you talk now of course about the strategy but uh, i love it so much that both you you are talking about kind of sustainability so it can happen maybe that uh, having uh, Producing less means also to have less inventory. So this means that maybe we can have uh, less product to, that can be wasted. So in this case, the general young consumer can perceive the product differently. Isn't it that somebody are talking on this? Do you, can you see this that can impact or it's take a long time? I think everything is very possible, especially right now. People have the time to restructure, to bring strategy, and I think that's super important. Um, I just was reading also the questions about, you know, the the, the mid-tier brands and the mid-companies having to be price sensitive and, you know, sourcing from China, which, again, I think reshoring is important, but that's also brand storytelling. You need to tell the story of, hey, 
our products are made in Italy. And I think that changes everything too. And a lot of the brands that we're working with that want to go premium, I'm pulling them back into telling them their production needs to go to, to be where their brands are from. So if their brands originated, say, in London, it needs to go back to the UK. If it originated in the US, it needs to go back to where the brand originated from because I'm a firm believer that that is you know, also ethically correct as well. Um, but in times like this, for example, with coronavirus and everything shut down, it gets super difficult to kind of work globally on your, on your uh, supply chain. Yeah, but in this case, uh, I like it also to answer to another, um, to another question I'm seeing right now, because some, some, ask, some is asking, but you were talking about educating the, the consumer. Mm -hmm. So what about American consumer? So how can we educate them to perceive the made in Italy or the made in differently? So in which way, Emily, you think is good? I think that there are so many portals for communication right now. I mean, if you look at Instagram, for example, it's the perfect example. When you go and view brands, what do they do? They push new product, right? All the time. But they don't really tell a story. And I think telling stories, again, that's what helps people fall in love with a brand. And yeah. that's what Nike does so well, right? They are the, the ones who invented this. They're so great at telling the story of a technology and innovation, and then they build an entire range around it. But that, you know, it's, it's a really smart way to do it because it involves the consumer and informs them. So they, they are part of this process. They will tell you all these stories about what's coming before it even gets there. So people are anticipating it. Um, and then you go to small scale, smaller scale brands. I mean, Stone Island is still big, but they do a phenomenal job with storytelling not on a Nike budget. And again, thinking about creative ways about doing that on a much smaller scale is, is super it. Yeah, but I think again, it's using all of these avenues of communication we have right now, even on a zero budget, you can spend time and figure out what is, what is your ethos? What is your idea? What do you stand for? What are the, why, why did you create these products? And then tell that story because that's what's that's what people fall in love with. And you look at influencers, right? People follow influencers because they become attached to these characters. And I think brands are the same. Brands are the same in terms of you need to be a little bit closer, tell the stories, and be real about it. So that's you know. Something I was that thinking. I, I was thinking about influencers. Me being the older person here. I was actually thinking, you know how it's been kind of like a, like a little bit egocentric, some of this influencer stuff. And that. Now, oh during the coronavirus <laughs> break, don't you feel that like real authenticity and real value and what to re-educate the customers? Why I told you, or yet I, when I come to Italy, I want to do a film. I want to bring uh, someone to really show the factories, show the love, show the passion, show the future, show the little towns. Like I brought up Oslo, you're in your town. Everybody has such beauty. We're talking Italy today, you know, but it's like why it should is was made there and why different regions have a passion because it's the, the land and what, what, why it is where it is. I don't know. I'm just babbling, but I think going away from this influencer and taking selfies mm -mm, is all, it's like back to real. Real was a time ago before all this started. And maybe this coronavirus is here on, I hate to say it, but maybe something happened because we need to change. Because I think we were talking about change before this happened. The kind of the same conversation, but this really brought a halt to make everybody, like even today we're on this, we're speaking about it. The change and educate the young people that working with your hands and making goods and, and really making them slower and at the end of the day seeing what you made is a happy feeling versus just buying 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 it's vacuous taking your picture looking at yourself in the mirror it's vacuous so 
sorry, as an old person, that's what I think. You know, I think the world agrees that it's too much, too many, and everyone wants more meaningful things. Yes, uh, real. Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. But the, like you, like you're like you, what we were saying before we started, what you do mixed with like this handmade and like taking real modern, efficient production with handmade. How do you somehow hand, hand it doesn't have to be just handmade, but real authentic product. It'd be interesting that the. Yeah. The, can I, I think, wow, I, I like it that you love so much Italy, so wow. I do, I do. So, but I think we already touched another very interesting part because producing better means also to sell better. So in the meantime, we like it to say in season pieces. So I guess that we went on talking about the meaning, the meaning can be also localized, durability, what, I think you, you touch it, but you have something to add in this topic, maybe, or you want to I, like, I like season less. Who mm -hmm. said that we need to have everything from summer on sale in June, July? When here in Seattle, it's just getting warm. And who said that you can't wear that then and this then? It's like, I, I just think like you were saying, Emily, the treadmill and they're calling you and they need to know how many 10 million units they can make in 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like slow down and everything is worth like I don't believe in that cycle and I never really had it have in our business and I think honestly that's what what has helped us because mm -hmm. I don't believe in mass markdowns sometimes I mark down last year's product this year just if I feel that we need to like coronavirus times or something but I don't believe to just make your stuff so like the customer comes in one month later and sees her shirt on sale, the, it's valueless. It's like, why did I spend this much money? She's mad. It hurts her feelings. It's like, why did I buy that? So I believe in, in making things important. So we are taking a few minutes more. So do you have time? You can stay a little bit minute more. Because yeah, uh, I enjoy to, to talk with you. And I, I think also that what you are saying and this kind of produce better and sell better, it just also answer it to another question, which is saying, yeah, okay, we love it made in Italy, but maybe it's too expensive, nobody understands. It's not true. So of course, it's a, it's a kind of answer of this. But can I, can I just jump in another step? Because in this case, I like, Emily's suggestion. So what about designing a collection? Do we have any changes? Because of course, we, in, in our community, we have plenty of designers, designer of materials, designer of products. And there are some people, so Sharon was saying, uh, seasonless. What do you think about this, Emily? I completely agree with Sharon about having seasonless, um, especially just working so globally right now where there's so many different seasons that happen at once that it's, it's really tough. But I think how will designing a collection change also is joint with the question before, right, of, of how the production, how it is affected. And I think, you know, again, it's a great time to be proactive, to sit down and for especially big companies to have a moment to say, okay, what are we doing wrong? Because we are there, we are currently answering questions to a wrong, uh, uh, sorry, giving answers to wrong questions. And we need to, to question that, you know, what is, why do we have to deliver so many seasons? Why so many pieces? And that business model needs to change first and foremost. And that change needs to come from the top and stream down to the bottom. So I think designing should become more efficient. It should become, again, sustainably minded. And, it, you know, if offshoring is possible or keeping things locally produced, that's great. Um, if it's not possible, then let's figure out the best way to do it. But again, I think designers um, should be more involved with the production process. Designers should help. 100%. Engineers and, you know, factory engineers to push competencies and to push ideas and to say, okay, if we could 
yield this much, how much more can we increase that? So to think of it about it from a very technical point of view, and I know there was another question about, you know, how can we, uh, how can how can we kind of make products better? Um, and because they're not always made best in Italy, and it's just okay. But you know, as Sharon was saying, within the factory's capabilities, what can you help them to do as well? Can you help them grow certain competencies and bring to the table like another innovation that you saw and help them grow it? Because I think that's going to be the strength of your brand. Yeah and yeah. also build strengths for the factory. And I think that becomes a really beautiful relationship instead of a designer coming in and saying, I need this because my boss told me it needs to be done yesterday. Yeah. And to, to create a different kind of relationship there is going to be super key, I believe. Yeah, I was, before one of the, some of the notes I was making and what, I, what part of the school I was talking about with my friend in Oslo is that I think mixing the maker with the designer, they're not always the same person. So, but I think in Italy, in the olden days, the, 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 there was a designer in the family and maybe there was someone that was good at, at the producing in the family and that became the family business and the family business grew. Some grew big, some grew smaller, but it's about like, like meeting people on Hinge a dating service what about meeting the maker and the designer so that together they're one the maker makes money and the designer makes money and together they're a team to me that's sustainable to me that's taking uh, a yin and a yang and you're making it one and it's gonna work but it can't be that the designer's just flipping out thinking that i want to make this weird creative thing but it could be that the maker and them together but it's a right marriage of the together you know mm -hmm. it's like meeting the right maker to the right designer but that's how these old huge great businesses succeeded nike when they first started he had a maker that understood him and they were kind of in a in a creative way the person that was doing the production was creative just like the designer was creative but together they were a team and then as it grew you know how it is you get your technical technical team and you're this and you're this and it's so out of school but to start over again would be to marry the design and the maker. And maybe in one region, they're really good at waxy thread and hand stitching, so all those bags are gonna be like that. In the other area, they're good at, at, at a polished, lighter weight leather with different kinds of stitching. It's, it's the marriage and what can you make within that kind of home of what they know how to do. It's my opinion. I just think it's a good way to start. I think it's perfect and even I, I jump to the next topic because this is also answering to one of the questions which is maybe one day Italian manufacturer but I, I, I mean that uh, manufacturer will also help small brands because in you know, this way uh, there is a customization, mass customization, uh, bespoke, uh, so uh, something that can help also to to work in this kind of connection and i, I remember uh, emily uh, we were discussing a lot about this kind of things that was something that even in a different types of field not only in fashion what, what do you think about this folk or customization? I, think, I think customization is going to be key but again finding a very efficient way of doing it um and really utilizing technology to do that i think is going to be great instead of you know, creating molds and mold after mold after mold. How can we do this better? Can we 3D print things? And I think that's going to be uh, really key, both in terms of, again, I keep saying sustainability, but that's something I think brands really need to push right now when there's time um, and, and plan for when there's time. And so I think it also helps to ex extend the lifetime, uh, the lifespan of a collection as well. When you have 10 pieces, for example, and if you have the ability to quickly customize small collections, then you don't have to run another line in order for it to be new again. And I think thinking very smartly and strategically about how to extend yeah. the line of a current line that you have is great. And you know, the more you can do that, I, I believe the stronger your brand is going to be, first and foremost. Your consumer has a very clear image of what your brand is and you know what kind of products you do, and you're also working a bit a, a lot more efficiently within within the system. 
So this, so you mean in this case, uh, it's interesting to have technology because technology can help you to figure out uh, to do some mass customization. I, I give, I give you some example. We have tanneries, and now they can offer raw materials so that you can choose and pick the different colors, the different typologies, and then you work on the finished product. So uh, I think also Sharon, at really the beginning, she said, I'm not really buying, but I make my product with the makers. So this is also the typology of uh, matching together. Uh, which technology can also speed up, maybe like, like uh, decrease in the prices sometimes. Just mm -hmm. thinking about this. Absolutely, and I think that's where, you know, product designers are industrial designers and they need to think a bit more industrialized. You're right, and you're right. Yeah. Understanding like what material capabilities are, what's the technology that I can use to change the properties of the material? Can I do a TPU overlay? How can I, how can I sonic weld things? And I think, again, pushing as much on innovation and technology for efficiency to create this customization idea. And you know, it, it's, it's such a great effect of just streamlining everything and making it better. Uh, you, you know, I love what you are saying because we have one of the, our question. We, we have somebody that is saying, really, can I, can I read it? Oh. I've been working with so many designers uh, that don't know anything about product and materials, and this is frustrating. So I imagine that this can be like a, a manufacturer or it can be also maybe a pattern maker, so a technician maker. This is really frustrating sometimes. Oh, for sure. And like that's what I like. I was before I got on the call, I told you I called Gianni just to ask him if I could talk about his school, et cetera, et cetera. But he said in the beginning, he only wants to teach about the leather, about how it is, what it is, where it's from using doing handwork doing and then he says then he'll teach them how to use the machinery because to understand your what you're doing and how it works and how you can manipulate it is how you can design it's it's exactly what emily's saying to really know it's it's almost like a real designer is also a real engineer you know and that's why i even said that the the marriage because the two can help each other you know, maybe one has an idea, but you really, even if you have an idea to make it come to fruition, you really have to understand how, how does it come together? Why is it? And how does that material work? I mean, that's how I work with people because I do understand that. And it's like, but it's like maybe some of the new, new kids coming out of school didn't learn that. So maybe it's going backwards and really learning with your hands and learning the quality and learning what it can do. And then learning with the new technology what they can do with the new, with the old leather, or, you know, like some of the pieces I saw when I was with you in LA, how they took and, and, and did all the manipulation to the leather. That's gorgeous. That's the marriage, you know, but anyway. I love also this part. And let me really, I, I grab this topic because I think can be also one of the topics that make a different perspective of me in Italy. You are talking about technology. You're talking about manipulation. You're talking about made in Italy. In this case, it's not only handmade and handcrafting, but it's also creating with technology because it's- For sure. Yeah, and this is helping the customization. Wow, that's- You can customize the leather, like the pieces you showed me, then the actual production is less time so that it's high quality leather that's been manipulated through modern technology that maybe takes one seam for the bottom, one seam for the side. It's simple, but it was the marriage of the maker and the designer to come up with some. It doesn't always have to be hand stitched, you know, vegetable leather, hard, heavy bags, but it could be modern combination. So, you know, the, the beautiful things you showed me, all of that could be easy to produce. Yeah, that's great. So uh, I think we just, uh, talk it like uh, 10 minutes more because uh, community, let me say that was so great to talk with uh, Sharon and Emily. So if we don't have any other 
to say, but actually let me say that we have several question and answer. In the next days, we want to post again our answer because Emily and Sharon will be connected with us. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much, Sharon. Really. Thank you. Thank you also to all the community and let's keep in touch very, very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.